Father, we pray that you would grant to us uh, wisdom as we seek to serve um, the brothers and sisters present. Uh, we pray that you might um, allow those who are, um, are here to uh, be such as would seek to search the scriptures, um, even for the answers that they seek, that they would not look upon um, this very group of men as though there was anything ultimate being said here, uh, but um, measure everything and judge everything that they hear in accordance to the word um, that is spoken. We pray that that which is true might abide strongly upon the hearts um, of all present, that you would use that truth um, to work convictions, to grant much grace um, and encouragement, even as we leave this place. We pray that the fruit of um, this very panel discussion and everything else that um, has been spoken by your grace and mercy um, that it would result um, in healthier churches that would more clearly display your gospel um, and your glory in this city and beyond. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Am I on? Okay. I'd like to start with a question for uh, Pastor Andy Johnson. Uh, specifically, if you could uh, highlight the relationship between evangelism and discipling. And then also, uh, whether you recommend and why, uh, disciple, dis meaningful disciple relationships uh, between members of different local churches. So first, evangelism and discipling. I mean, these are words that we're sort of using. But when I'm, when I'm thinking about discipling, I'm thinking about a relationship with someone who is a disciple. Who's, they've already repented of their sins. They've trusted in Christ. They're intending to follow after Christ. Uh, certainly, evangelism is what you would do before that. Just befriending anyone, sharing the gospel with them. You know, calling them to repent and trust in Jesus. And then, I think... Often relationships, it's very natural. If I've shared the gospel with somebody, they believe the gospel. We've been studying scripture together. They turn to repent. They say they want to follow Jesus. Well, it's pretty normal for that relationship to continue. And to that person, it's just, they still have a relationship with me. But I've switched. I'm now trying to help them follow Jesus. When before, I wanted them to see their sin, see their need for a savior, understand what Jesus had done. So... In practice, it may just look like one smooth relationship, but I think it's two different things. The second question about people from different churches, uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think the most normal thing is that we'd be in relationships with people from our own church that we've committed to. But I've had relationships with people where I work, um, students that weren't part of my church. The one thing I have always thought Biblically, is I want to, part of how I want to be discipling that person is to be an active member of a local church. So I had one guy that I worked with that wanted to meet up with me to study the Bible, but he wasn't, he, was, he intended to be a Christian, but he wasn't a part of a church. He wasn't committed to a church. He wasn't going to join our church. He lived off a distance away. So basically, all I did in discipling was tell him he needed to join a local church and try to show him that from the Bible. Uh, but I think it was a fine thing for me to do. I just don't think that's, that's not going to be the basic place we're going to be living our lives out together as Christians. Question for uh, Pastor Mark Dever. Uh, the scriptures point to a multiplicity of elders. However, due to some considerations, is it biblical and appropriate to have a single elder-led congregation? Uh yeah, I think the answer, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> I think the short answer to that is yes. Uh, but all the examples of the New Testament that we have are of multiple elders in a single congregation. But if we believe what we read in Ephesians chapter 4, that it's Christ who gives gifts to his church of pastors and teachers, we can't require, require Christ to give us so many elders per members of our church. So if, if he's given us one pastor who can preach the word and teach the word and we have 700 people, well then we got one pastor. We can't make them. So, How does a church go about uh, reforming their church government without breaking the church? <laughs> the question's directed to you. <laughs> well, if you allow me to break the church, it's a much easier answer. But... Um... <laughs> Slow, patient, prayerful teaching.
Is there any, any kind of indication of, of timeline or some way that you know when the church is ready to make a change? <laughs> If you've been, let's just take the last question, elders, if you've been teaching, let's say you're in a church with one pastor, and he's the only one who, who is regarded as an elder, as an overseer, as a bishop, as a pastor, they're all used, all these words are of course used interchangeably in the New Testament, there's only one person regarded like that in your church, that person, you, have been teaching faithfully for several years now, that there seems to be a plurality of such people in the churches of the New Testament, and that our church would be strengthened by having a plurality of people like that. When you start having your people asking you, hey, if the Bible teaches that, couldn't we do that? Why don't we do that? That's probably a good sign it's, it's time to go, especially if you see two or three or four guys the Lord has raised up that could serve like that. Uh, I think it's also uh, wise to consider the fact that uh, in the process of reforming a local church, the possibility of a division may, may be inevitable. Uh, I know pastors here and uh, brethren who have been laboring and uh, have been patient in their congregations to reform them, but the effect has been people who reject the gospel and there is no way they would be a part of that local church. So. Uh, they have had to face the sad reality of a division. Um, so in the process of bringing the truth of God's word to the people, and that's what we see in Acts throughout. Uh, Paul comes to a city, brings the gospel, people receive it, others reject it. Uh, that's true of a city and it's also true of a church where um, some people will embrace the doctrines of grace, others might not, and you need to be prepared for that as well. Pastor Ken, you have um, maybe some experience you can speak to uh, reform in church government. Um, maybe, maybe you could speak to, to the issue from, from experience. Experience is a strong word. <laughs> I've been, I'm 37, so I don't think I know much about um, experience. And the path the Lord, I think, has had me on has been an unusually um, sweet one. Um, without any troubles. Um, so, yeah, um, I think I would just echo what Mark said. When we were trying to work in some changes, you know, our church, we met up on Sunday afternoons um, for maybe two hours, and we taught on the very topic that we intended to work into the church. So if it was church discipline, we um, labored in the text to show the, um, those present, this is what the Bible says about church discipline. And we did that a couple of times, and we got to the point where, um, even in our members' meetings, when we would raise up names, um, folk in the church would ask, well, surely we've gotten to this point with this particular individual. Um, I think this is the next step that we ought to take. Um, and it was still a couple of more months before we actually got to the point where we did um, church discipline. So, yeah, to, to be wary, I think, um, in this process, it's, it's very easy to, to take um, these principles that you're even hearing of membership or discipline, et cetera, et cetera, and and just kind of do them, you know, while, while, without understanding the heart behind them, um, the spirit um, that should inform them and drive them, and they can end up displaying a very different thing than the glory of God. I've, sh I've sat in, in uh, membership meetings where um, it's church discipline that was being exercised and it was the most horrible thing mm. I've ever seen. Um, it was nasty, the spirit was off, um, there was no love, there was no grieving um, for the sinner that was being put out. It was so mechanical and we need to be very afraid of doing that. Um, in many ways I think we should be very hesitant um, um, before we, we, we just go back to our churches and start saying stuff that we haven't quite um, understood. Um, and we ourselves will seek to, uh, to lead our churches down that path to have the humility to keep learning, um, to keep asking, um, to talk to those who have gone down that path before and keep asking for advice very much, I guess, as the question is, um, is doing. Sure. sure. Can I add, add one thing to that, Jeremy? One common problem with young guys that I've found, at least in, in the States and other places, is when they hear a message like Vincent on church membership, or James on church discipline, and they haven't thought about it much before, they take very good notes, they go back, they teach exactly that, so they can say they've taught, and then they try to start doing it. That's almost never a good idea. It may be occasionally, 
But generally, it's like with your own kids. You don't teach your children something once and they learn it. Well, maybe sometimes. Maybe you were like that as a kid. But, well, apparently not from your testimony. But with most of us, when we were children and most of our own children, we'll teach them something five times or ten times or a hundred times or a thousand times. That's, that's how we learn things. So the fact that you can tick a box and say, I taught that, now we're ready to do it. That's why I think Paul keeps using that word patiently in the pastoral epistles. You know, with patience. You teach them, you know, five times, ten times. You have 30 conversations in which you're answering the same question again and again and again. That's how you, you kind of know then they're getting ready where the, the people in your church are asking, oh, can we do that? Because the Bible says it. There's a number of people here who are not in pastoral positions and may be hearing uh, some of these uh, concepts for the first time. Sometimes they've become familiar with them, but they don't know how to approach uh, the leadership of their church if they're in an unhealthy church. Do you have any words of advice about how to handle um, church reform as somebody who's working maybe from underneath? Um, yeah, the Bible has some instructions for us, um, and we're informed about how to approach older men, um, the caution with which we should um, approach conversations like this when speaking to elders, um, seeking to ensure that there is all honor. And, and respect as, as we speak. That's something to consider. Um, secondly, it depends on what it is that we're talking about. Um, in some ways, I don't think you could say that all the marks are equal, even though all the marks are important. If somebody is preaching for a false gospel in that particular congregation, um, I think there's, there's a particular level of, um, um, yeah, seriousness that you, you approach that conversation with. Um, I don't think if you're a member of the church, you should view it as though it is your responsibility to reform the church. Um, I think it is definitely your responsibility to call out that which is wrong and speak to your pastor and those who are preaching a false gospel and say, this is not the truth. Um, here's what the Bible says about what the gospel truly is. Um, however, I would be hesitant to seek to cause a division in the church. I would, however, um, seek to convince as many as possible. If, if, this, is, if this is not the gospel being preach, let's say it's the prosperity gospel that is blatantly being articulated. Um, I, I think it is, yeah, without the aim being to cause division, I would seek to convince everybody who would hear me um, to turn away from a false gospel um, and to turn to the truth about what the Lord has, um, has articulated in his word. Um, at the same time, I would not try to do the same thing if it was a conversation regarding multiplicity of elders, let's say. Um, whereas I think with the gospel, it's a matter of life and death, the eternal security um, of those who are sitting underneath a false um, you know, message every single Sunday. I don't think it's the same exact thing when it comes to multiplicity of elders. Um, it's a biblical thing. It's a very important thing, right? Um, but I don't think I would approach it with the same tone. Um, yeah. That's my thinking there. I could perhaps give an example of a, of a lady who um, had, uh, first of all, read, then heard me teach uh, election in a university. And uh, she, her father is a pastor, is her pastor. So she went and asked her, why is it that I've never heard you mention anything about uh, election? And it's in the Bible. And uh, the father said, because I don't believe it, I will never teach it. And so she came back to me, and it's, it's, it's all very complicated because her pastor is her father. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are, what, are we, what am I going to do? I, how can I possibly be part of a church where my father says so clearly that this is uh, what the Bible says, but I don't believe it, and I won't teach it? Um, I, I, I counseled her to go to the father and seek to understand what actually he believed about election. And uh, it turned out that uh, the father was basically, uh, he knew the doctrine, but he wasn't interested in making it, uh, making it known. Uh, so my counsel to her was, in as much as this is your dad, in as much as uh, this is a church where you've grown up in, uh, you have to obey God rather than men. And, and 
very few people are willing to take that position. She did take the position and left our own dance for, uh, church. Uh, mm. And uh, it took quite a lot of boldness because it brought a lot of family friction. But the point I'm making is, if the Bible teaches it, you need to find out from your pastor why is it that uh, these things are not being taught from the pulpit or what is, their understand what is the pastor's understanding of this truth. Uh, if it is contradictory to the scriptures, I can't see how you can possibly say that this is a faithful ministry and remain there. Mm. Clarity on qualifications for church membership. How What's your process for knowing that an applicant is qualified to be a church member? Uh, what we do very similar to our church is similar to what I think Vincent said they do at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, somebody comes, we announce regularly in our services that we have classes every Sunday morning, membership classes. There are six of those. You can take them in any order, but you have to take all six. Once you've taken those six classes, then you contact the church saying you'd like an interview. You come to the interview knowing that you'll be asked to sign our statement of faith and our church covenant. So we assume that you agree the Bible teaches what the statement of faith says, and that the Bible teaches what the church covenant says, and that you intend to live that way. And then in the membership interview with an elder and usually one other person will spend 30 minutes to an hour uh, getting to know your testimony. We'll ask you how you came to Christ. We'll ask you a bit about your background, what church you've been in. We'll want to get to know your understanding of the gospel. We'll ask you to tell us what is the good news of Jesus Christ um, and other basic life facts. Then we take all of that information down and copies of that that we've written that on are given to the elders at the next elders meeting. The elders will all look at that. They'll ask questions to the man who did the interview and if the man who did the interview is recommending it, which if he weren't recommending it, it wouldn't even come to the elders. Uh, if the person didn't understand the gospel very well, the elder doing the interview would probably just turn it into a, an evangelistic Bible study that they might do for a few weeks in a row with this person. Um, but if the elder is recommending them and he thinks they're a Christian, uh, then that's going to go to the elders. The elders recommend it. Then that will go to our next members meeting. We have members meetings every other month. That would go there. At that members meeting, the elder who did the interview would stand up and give like a brief summary of the person's testimony and then they would take any questions from the congregation and then the congregation would vote. And uh, on an affirmative vote, then uh, that week they would be notified that they're now a member of the local church. Um, so I think it's critical to say that nobody's saying that that particular process you've described is prescriptive, um, but just rather an example of a church that is, is, is singularly trying to do one thing, be careful about the way in which they're going through the process of receiving members into the congregation. So I think it is important to say that how careful looks like in your context might be exceedingly different. Yeah, one thing to add, in, in America we have the situation where I fear most Bible-believing pastors, if they've got 100 people in their church one Sunday, and the next Sunday, 20 of those people who were there are gone, but 50 more have come. Well, they care more that they've got 130 people when they just had 100 last Sunday than they do about those 20 who aren't there. And that doesn't smell like Jesus. That smells like a marketer. Jesus cares about the sheep. He exalts the man who leaves the 99 to go find the one who's straying. Americans have gotten a business idea of bottom line show me numbers that I think is from hell. And it will confuse shepherds. Shepherds won't know what to do. They'll be blinded by the numbers and they won't think of the people. So what we're trying to do in our church is just be careful with each person. Because each person we take into membership, we're telling them, John, if you die, you're going to be okay for all eternity. That's a big deal. So we don't want to be light on that. We don't want to be casual on that. Because we don't know what's... We can't really know, know John's heart. All we have is the external evidence. What he says, what we can see. So we want to be very careful. Uh, because we love John. And we want him to be with the Lord for all eternity. And we don't want to mislead him. And by quick and casual ways to increase your membership, you can mislead people for all eternity. And you really don't want to do that. Just for clarity, Mark, what would you say are the essential things that you're looking for in that very interview as you're talking to the prospective new member? Right understanding of God, man, Christ, response, and the evidence that they're following that in their own life. 
Mark, I might add, because I think just getting the, the question, I think sometimes people feel like if you're really careful about church membership, then you must have a very high standard for who can be a member of your church. Like they need to have this level of theological knowledge. They need to memorize all the books of the Bible. They, but, but that wouldn't be true at our church. I mean, we have, we have people that join our church that have been Christians for, you know, 48 hours. Yeah, they, all they know is they're a sinner. Jesus died for their sins and they intend to trust in him and follow him forever. And they see our church covenant, our statement of faith, and they're like, yeah, I'm happy to agree with that stuff. But I think it's good to recognize, and this is where just talking with other pastors, there's always this tension between carefulness and not having an unbiblical standard or test for who could be a member of a church. And you're going to have to figure that out exactly you know, with other brothers and sisters around you. Yeah, we'll use the phrase of judgment of charity. If it's right on the line, we're always going to let him in. Because that way we get to try to work with them and see what's going on and help them spiritually. Um, uh, listening to you and what you also do at uh, Trinity, uh, two qualifications for one to be a member. One, uh, he must be a believer and no question about that. They know it. Other people know that this is a Christian and there is fruit to show for it. Number two, there is a willingness. There is, they, they want to voluntarily come under uh, the leadership of this church. They, this is a church that they have willingly come into. So they're not forced. Uh, not that uh, because my husband is a member here, I must be a member. I mean, we have so many families where um, uh, we have a case where a lady has been a member for uh, 20 something years and the husband is a Christian, but he isn't a member. It's now that he's considering to be a member after 22 years. Uh, it's not tied to any relationship within the church. It's their own heart moved by the Lord to want to be part of this church. So voluntarily want to be members. Um, and then uh, the other principle is uh, they say that they are Christians, <laughs> But does anyone in the church know that they are Christians? Is there any fruit to show for it? So the uh, debate about taking them to, having been considered by the eldership, taking it to the church, it's for two purposes. One, that uh, the church would hear their testimony and ask questions if there are questions to be asked about either their belief or their, their conduct. And two, <clears throat> The church has a testimony of how they live. Then it is the church to accept them into the membership. For many Baptist churches, I think, uh, it's the elders who decide that you can be a member and they just announce it to the, to the church. Mm. Uh, that is really flawed because the person is not becoming part of the eldership to be only interviewed by the elders. The church is instrumental in admitting them into the church, and that's why it has to be by a vote. That's a very, very basic decision to be made by the church. Yeah, uh, if you wanted to think more about that idea of voting, I mean, because I, I agree with what Ken said earlier, I wouldn't say the, wasn't saying the way that we admit members is how every church needs to do it exactly. That's just how we do it. I think there's a good bit of liberty in the New Testament. If it doesn't say it clearly, then there's a matter of liberty. We're doing things with prudence, what we think is wise. But on this idea of voting, I've had friends tell me, Mark, you're just into voting because you're on Capitol Hill. You know, you're in the United <laughs> States. And I go, well, well, not really. I mean, this is a much older idea than the United States. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul writes to the Corinthians, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? The majority of what? It's referring to the majority of the members of the church. So they clearly, and if you look into the Greek, that word plainum means majority. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just what he's saying. So apparently, in Greek city-states, they were used to voting anyway, so it's not surprising that when Christians in an assembly make a decision, they make a decision by voting. I mean, how else are you going to know? You could probably come up with some other ways to do it. You could put the names up if nobody objects. Then you take that as a basic affirmation. But I just want to say it's not against the New Testament. It's not some later time in history imposition on Christian churches that we vote. It's actually there in the New Testament. Thank you so much. My name is Mark from Crisco Church, Kimilili. 
there was a, there's a clarification I want to get from, from us here. Yeah? Just a clarification whether the church also is open to non-believers who may come, hear the word, and maybe the word convicts them, and then after that conviction, what would be the process of that non-believer now to be incorporated into the church? Just to be clear, um, yeah, when we talk about the membership of the church, we are talking about something different than the people who attend um, um, the church's gatherings on Sunday. So we want, as yeah, we want unbelievers to come and hear the gospel on Sunday. They're exceedingly welcome. We are happy when they come. Uh, we want to love on them well. We want to welcome them. We uh, want to share the gospel with them. And and so it's exceedingly important that we do not confuse what you're talking about when you say membership uh, with those who are gathering on Sunday. Um, if that person who has come um, has become a believer, whether it is at the very service that was being held or um, from, a different, uh, from a different place, we, we, we will accept them on the basis of their profession. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we are recommending you take um, you know, um, a month, a year, um, half a year um, to do some investigative um, you know searches into his life um, run you know you know questions in the entire marketplace um, to ask but uh, the the testimony at face value. Um, are we are asking you: Do you believe in the gospel? What, what is the gospel? Um, would you tell me? Would you tell me what it is that you have believed for your salvation? And sometimes somebody will answer, and it will not be clear. And you can prod them with another question: um, Okay, would you say this? Would you say that? Um, um, and. You keep asking, and, and, and if it becomes clear to you that maybe they do not understand the gospel, sometimes we'll even say, it might actually be that you are a believer, but, but you, it's not clear from the testimony that you're sharing. How about we meet a couple of weeks and talk about this? How about you read something and then come back again? And if this is really what you believed, even before you came, then amen. We praise the Lord for this. And we will um, happily receive you into the membership of the church. Um, but if it is not, then we'll compel you. We'll, we'll say to you often, allow this to be the very um, first act of um, us shepherding you as, as you've come to us um, and allow us to seek to teach you and to walk you into what the Bible says about how one can actually be reconciled um, to God again. But um, you're not refusing people to join who you don't like um, because they're not, you know, of your particular tribe. They don't like you. You think they might, they might even cause problems in the future. Um, I, I think you're, you're, you're receiving them on the simple basis of this person is bearing a clear witness that they are a Christian and that their lives are, um, as far as we know and as far as we can tell, in line with that very testimony. And that as they're joining, um, they're happy to submit themselves to this congregation. And this is who this congregation is. It is a congregation that believes in these particular things um, and it is a congregation that governs itself in these particular ways. And if you, knowing all of that, are happy to join with us, um, you're, you're welcome to join. So, yeah. Um, I think there is one thing that we've also not mentioned, uh, which is baptism. Yeah. Uh, so having gone through the process, uh, if this person uh, is not from another church and they were not baptized as believers, they need to be baptized. It's that public um, you know, confession that would uh, mark the beginning of this person being recognized in this new congregation as a believer and therefore a member of the church and would be welcome for the Lord's Supper uh, subsequent to that. So um, th that's how you would then know the difference between all those who attend uh, and, and those who are members. And the church is constituted, uh, by, uh, it's constituted by the members, not everyone who attend. You know, just in case it gets lost. I think we sometimes there are people who get really caught up on the how. The how is very important, but we should never lose sight of the why. Yeah. And I think if we, if again, if we ourselves and our churches are not very clear on the why is this important, run away from this stuff. Um, because it's going to be kind of inoculating people with church membership, and by the time they come around to the real church membership, they're like, I want nothing to do with church membership because they have seen it done in the past. It's, it's, it's something 
totally different from what um, the Bible is articulating. So keep reminding yourself that the why is what's important. So that even the way you go about it is being informed by how do I best do the thing I'm trying to do, which is to guard the church, guard the gospel, avoid giving to someone false confidence that they are a Christian by allowing them to join our church, whereas actually they have not even the most basic understanding of the gospel. So it's a challenge even for our, 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 our churches right here, just now. Um, are you confident that if you were to speak to your average member and ask them the question, are you really a Christian and why do you think you're a Christian? Do you have confidence that when you stand before the Lord on that last day that you will be received home? Are you confident of the answer that you will hear coming from? From them. Will they clearly say, yes, I know that my God is holy and I am a wretched sinner, but I'm fully confident that the work that Christ has done on the cross for me is sufficient to cleanse me of my, my iniquity and he has graciously worked faith and repentance in me. And if you're not confident of that, perhaps the place to begin is actually by preaching the gospel all the more clearly in your own congregation and make sure that you have articulated it um, so clearly from multiple passages of scripture before you even begin this very process. And maybe you begin with even people who have been there for a very, very long time. Just say, hey, just to be clear, because this is an all-important thing. We do not want to be casually, right, going along from week to week with people singing in the choir, ushering, doing all manner of things in our church, confident that they are believers. And then on the last day when we're giving an account for them, it is found that the most basic, most important, most essential of messages was something that they did not even know. So say, hey, church, let's 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 consider going back again and actually doing this as carefully as we can um, from um, from the scriptures. Um, Pastor Bwasi from Bungoma, Naema Baptist Church. I would like to know more about uh, election in church leadership or elder because sometimes we have seen elections, especially from Proverb 18:18. 18, 18. If we, who are supposed to, to vote or to have that election in the church? Because you, in our local church, you may see we might be having elections in the church and maybe we have maybe newcomer members that have been there for only two weeks or three weeks and election can be held. You know, and you know, we, we are having leaders who are, who, are, who are to be elected and thereafter they may have lured some people to come, and these are not maybe bona fide members. Being there for quite some few little weeks after voting, then they go. How can you do with such like a case? Thank you. I understand what uh, our, our brother there is talking about. Um, so you want to bring in, uh, you want to, uh, the church needs to elect leaders uh, by a vote, as we said. But then, uh, uh, this church is already in a mess in that uh, the pastor thinks that the way to be elected in is by bringing in new people who would vote, in, who vote him in and uh, be on their way. Uh, so that's a question. What, so in the first place, I would say that that church is not healthy. <laughs> the church isn't healthy, and that's why the pastor is conducting, himself, uh, conducting things that way. And then secondly, the pastor isn't qualified to be a pastor if that's the way he's going to carry things. It's not biblical. Um, and then thirdly, the way membership is being done is also not biblical. So there are so many things in that congregation that needs to be changed. In the first place, it's the, it's the leadership. Are they going to be biblical? Are they going to teach the truth and expound it to the members and to the people there so that they would embrace the gospel, embrace the truth of God's word, teach them the whole counsel of God so that uh, they think biblically? <laughs> Number two, is he himself, the pastor, willing to subject himself and submit to the authority of the word of God? So that if he is not qualified, according to 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 and Titus 1, 5 to 9, then he shouldn't hold office. Uh, and, you know, if you're a pastor and the majority of the members in the church do not think that you should be their pastor, you shouldn't be their pastor. Right. If the Lord is going to 
give you that opportunity to pass to people, there should be absolute confidence from the congregation as the way to affirm that you're actually, uh, you've actually been appointed by the Lord. So I would say that that church isn't healthy and everything there would be messy. Uh, our church has three public meetings every week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. All three of those are open to anybody who wants to come. We'd like everybody to come. Uh, our members meetings where we do our voting are not open to the public. They're only for members of our church. We don't do them during our Sunday morning service or during our Sunday evening service or during our Wednesday night service. So our members meeting is just for members of the church. So 200 people couldn't come in who aren't members of the church. I mean, I guess they could try, but I mean, it, you know, it'd be very, very odd. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, I think also it's, it's, it's important we ask ourselves, what are we trying to guard, right? So let's make sure that we don't take the instructions in about membership, um, it, it being told about voting. The ideas then that are being, you know, taught are not so much about job security for us. Um, if the primary, if the primary passion in our hearts is um, how do we display the gospel as a community of believers, how do we display the glory of God as a, as a church, you'll find that you're most probably trying to fix things from way back when, not, not at the members meeting. Um, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. Um, I have to have some level of confidence um, that if those who are gathered are sheep, um, are truly Christian, that they will then seek to conduct themselves to some measure, um, not in accordance to the same um, shenanigans that we will see in by-elections. Um, but I can at least hold up the authority of God, with the word of God with authority and say, if you're believers, this is how you are to conduct yourself. If you try and simply govern the lives of those present using rules as far as your meeting goes, I mean, that's trying to get goats to act like sheep um, and that's not the solution there but it goes all the way back again to the importance of membership and discipline if we are habitually um, carefully receiving into the church such as have shown a clear understanding of the gospel and if we are continuing to disciple those who are present by proclaiming God's word and calling the whole church to submission to the authority of scripture right if we are receiving to the table um, such as are walking in repentance in their lives um, you end up finding then that it's not that members' meetings are going to necessarily be all fluid and um, um, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's more of I surely should. I expect that if these people are Christians, they should not be pulling up their chairs and um, throwing them at each other or bringing rocks and hiding them under the chair, um, preparing themselves for that members meeting to begin. Um, these things have happened, as you know. Um, your, your problems began a long time ago um, before that place, and you will not fix it just by using a few um, bylaws being added into the Constitution on how our members meetings are supposed to be run. Uh, one of the observations I've made in many churches in this country is uh, the way business meetings are conducted is after the service you hear the announcement, all the members to remain behind and then you're going to have a church meeting. People, those, those, those members uh, have not thought about the agenda, they have not prayed about it and then you ambush them with all kinds of things right, left and center. Obviously, they won't be able to, uh, they may not be able to think clearly or pray about it. The business meeting that Pastor Deva has talked about is arranged way in advance. The agenda is given way in advance for members to think about it, pray about it, and consider it. And where there is a need to interview or speak with someone about anything that is not understood, it's done way before the meeting. But if it's a meeting that is you know, announced 30 minutes in advance, it's likely to bring problems. Jeremy Cook, Lavington Vineyard Church. I imagine there are a number of us here, like where the, the church where I serve, where we don't have membership. Um, but perhaps we've started faithfully, trying to faithfully teach on it. Uh, but we may be some years down the road. So assuming that the elders get on board and we start to present it to the church, 
let's say we have 100 plus people already in the church who are quite comfortable being there, not being a member. So then when you want to start that process of bringing them into membership, I know it's a how-to question, but how, what advice would you give to those of us in that situation with interviews and all that? How do you bring that many people into now membership? Well, I would uh, say that uh, the first step is teaching them. Teach them the Bible, show them how the Church of Christ is to function. Um, and when you get to the point where you think that uh, the church is ready to be constituted into membership, don't do it alone. Uh, look for men who have done this before, uh, get their wisdom, get their experience, and let them do with you, especially the first time, so that uh, uh, they may deal with some of these issues that you may not know since they have had that experience, they've done it before. And uh, uh, there, I think there are a number of uh, books that, uh, that could help us uh, to that end. Um, beginning with uh, Nine Marks, that would be a, a very good book to, uh, to, to teach the church through so that they may know what we are doing. And, uh, uh, you know, a book like um, Christ Loves His Church and So Should You by L. Blackburn. Um, there are a few books that uh, could uh, help in helping the pastor take the church through the process of uh, constituting membership and uh, the church. Say it's a necessity, I would just start right there. It's not in the Bible. You don't have to have a Christian union, a school, or a chaplaincy in an army. I would say there are opportunities, and I would encourage you to look at them fundamentally as evangelistic, not discipling. So fundamentally, it's a way to help people in the armed services come to know the Lord. It's a way to help students come to know the Lord. Insofar as you can give teaching, that's good. Uh, that's, a, that's a limited time opportunity, but you can tell it's different than the church because it's not there for everybody. It's only there for students. It's only there for soldiers. So I would just encourage you to look at it like a mission parachurch organization. Make sure that if you're in leadership, you're well involved in a local church, that you're getting wisdom from the elders at your local church. I guess if you're out at sea and you cannot attend a local church nearby, um, you might have a good reason to not gather with the rest of the saints on Sunday. If you're in a campus um, somewhere in the city, I'm pretty sure that there's many opportunities to gather with the church. And it's useful to understand that even though you can preach the Bible um, at these gatherings, the church is so much more than that. Um, and, and those believers that you love as a chairman or a committee in the CU, if you love those believers and you want to see them mature, you understand that they need so much more that you cannot give them in that particular setting. Um, so you will lovingly encourage them to go and find a church that they can submit themselves to, where God's word is preached, to commit themselves to that particular church, to form meaningful relationships with other believers there, so to submit themselves to the elders, um, to seek discipling relationships, right, to attend um, um, the, the Lord's Supper um, with all carefulness, um, to seek to profit from other parts of the body, um, the arms, the leg, whatever the Lord has deposited in that particular congregation, they need it for their nourishment. Um, and I think to, to assume that you can take away a believer and still expect to disciple them in their dorm room um, and that they should be able to grow as they were meant to grow is, is a little bit, um, um, yeah proud of ourselves. Raymond, in that little book I did called Discipling that's blue, there's one chapter on the local church as a good context for discipling. That might be specifically helpful for you. I have a question. Uh, final question. Yes. I'd like to Pastor Msemi. He articulated yesterday clearly from the book of Psalms showing us how we should rejoice in the word and Theologically, I would approve, uh, I feel like, yes, every other point is coming up. And most of uh, our members and most of myself, maybe, you are not able to do that, uh, to speak and to show every other point, uh, just asking people, remember that this is said somewhere else, this is how you see it, how, this, how sweet it is, righteousness, juicy, you get. How do we go about it? Um, uh, for other person to rejoice in the same, articulating the same to in evangelism, and the other person can feel, yes, God's word is this juicy, this God's word is this like honey cup, this word is so beautiful. Like, 
not on the level of pastor, but on the level of one-on-one -on -one between members so that we can feel it, we have this word. It's saturated in us, saturated in myself. Yes. So, I was really enjoying not saying anything. Thank you, brother, for... <laughs> For breaking that record. Um, so I, I don't want to make a distinction between the pastor's relationship with, with his Bible and the member's relationship with his Bible. The pastor is an example uh, to the congregation. Uh, so you want to be careful not to make distinctions. Obviously, uh, because of the fact that I'm preparing to, to teach, my study may, may go into a, bit, a little bit more rigor uh, I, may, I may be digging into historical context, um, languages, etc., etc., a little bit uh, extra because I'm preparing to come and communicate this to people. But the, the idea of reading God's word, uh, Bible study, uh, you shouldn't make distinctions between what the pastor does and, 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 and the congregation. So that's the first thing I want to be careful because I don't want to, you don't want to create a notion in people that I can't know God's word how my pastor knows it. You don't want to do that. Uh, in fact, you want to train your people uh, to, to get to where he is, to be able to know God's word as well as he does. I would consider that a success um, in ministry. In terms of how do you do that? Um, prayerfully study God's word. Um, you know, schedule sufficient time uh, to read the word of God. Um, you know, ask yourself the question, what does this text mean? What does this text say? What does it mean? What is the implication of this text in my life? Um, and then bring in other resources at your disposal that can help you gain further insight, further understanding on the, on the meaning of this particular text. Pray that the Holy Spirit would apply that text into your life and then let the, the fruit of that be what then you go and share with other members uh, when you're discussing, you know, what you're learning in God's word. So one of the things that I try to encourage people is to develop a tenacity, uh, you know, a rigor, a, um, a sense of perseverance with God's word. John, uh, John 8, 31, if you abide in my teaching, if you hold fast to my teaching, if you persevere, uh, if you have um, uh, a relationship with the Bible where you are you're like, I will not let you go until you bless me. Uh, kind of a relationship with a text, right? Instead of uh, the Levite in the, in, the, in the story of Jesus, you know, who sidestepped the Samaritan. Sometimes we treat certain passages of scripture that way. Uh, you, you read a passage, you don't quite get what it's about, and you just keep over it and move on to uh, something else. So I would encourage uh, that you that you develop uh, that kind of rigor, where you will hold on to a text, you will wrestle with the text, you will prayerfully ask God to illuminate your mind so that this text, uh, you know, makes sense to your mind, uh, brings joy to your heart. Uh, there is work involved, uh, but it bears fruit in the long run. I hope I've answered something in what you've right. said, in what you've asked. I'd like to uh, call, call this to a, a close. Uh, you obviously have uh, more questions, and these men are still here uh, and available. I'm sure they would be pleased to answer your questions one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, Pastor Angie Johnson, would you be willing to uh, close this in a word of prayer? Father, we... Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we pray that you would continue to encourage us from your word. Lord, we pray that one of the fruits of these few days together would be a renewed confidence uh, that your scripture is sufficient for your church. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we talk with one another and try to get wisdom from one another, we would supremely be uh, looking for wisdom that comes from your word, that's rooted in your scripture. And Lord, we pray that as we do that, uh, you would bless our churches as we know you intend to do because you love your bride. Lord, we pray that you'd bless the remainder of our time together today and that you would be preparing good things uh, for our churches as we go back together with them. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.